Upstairs at Frelix, show 105, real one. Fry him! Fry him! Burn him up! And if I may just interject one thought of my own, tear him up! Rip him apart! Burn him! And in conclusion, die, 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 die! So, Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. <laughs> Direct, directed by J.F. Lawton under a different pseudonym. What was the pseudonym he used for this one? I, I don't know. J.H. Hewton? <laughs> Something weird. Let me, let me double check real quick. This is a bizarre... I, I, actually, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie because it is... It, you go into a movie with a title like that and you think that it's going to be one thing and it winds up being something else. Oh, it does. J.D. Athens, by the way, was the pseudonym. J.D. Athens. Uh, uh, first, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about Bill Maher. Um, Bill Maher's in the movie, and he was also, I mean, he was also in a, a movie called Pizza Man, also directed by J.F. Lawton. He, uh, he was a guy I admired for a long time when he had called himself like a libertarian, but now he's backing away from that classification, plunging full force into Trump, and he's obsessed, like Whoopi Goldberg or Rosie O'Donnell, with Trump. And, but... He he started off. He was a stand-up comedian after after he, he was acting. He because he was in a bunch of movies. He was in DC Cab, if you remember. I do. And he was in House Two, the second story. Great part in that one too. Sleaze bag, life imitating <laughs> art, by the way. Yeah, and I believe also John Ratzenberger was in 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 House Two, uh, and he was Cliff from Cheers. And George Went was in House, the first House movie, and he was Norm from Cheers. So it was like. They had to do the Cheers connection. They had to. I guess. I mean, it was. It was. It, I mean, House Two was directed by the screenwriter of the first one. Right. So I mean, even though um, Fred Decker and Steve Miner were not part of House Two, at least Ethan Wiley was still part of that movie. So it still had that feel. And I love how House Two was so hated when it came out, but now everyone loves it. That's right. And I always loved House. Well, too. House. I mean, the first House movie was fantastic. I absolutely love that movie. I, 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 that was a movie that I rented and rented and rented, and then I got it into my head. Wait a minute, I have two VCRs. I'll just record it. Yeah, because New, New World tapes didn't have <clears throat> copy protection. Damn it! No, they didn't. But uh, Bill Maher, very talented comedian, and then he he uh, he created the show Politically Incorrect, and that was a great show. It was a mix of. Ridiculous celebrities, ridiculous politicians. And then it was canceled because, I don't know, because people don't balls anymore after 9-11. Um, and then real time started, but then that veered away from the format. And now, now he just, he kind of feeds the social justice warrior mentality, even though when you watch him on the show, you can tell he doesn't believe most of the shit they sling. But I do think he's starting to get some of his brain back. When I say this is a feminized country, first of all, that I get it that there are millions and millions of women who are steely-eyed realists and millions and millions of men who are anything but. However, for lack of a better term, I would say that the feminine values are now the values of America. Sensitivity is more important than truth. Feelings are more important than facts. Commitment is more important than individuality. Children are more important than people. Safety is more important than fun. But. We must always remember Bill Maher is the guy who headlined Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. I mean, so did Shannon Tweed, Adrian Barbeau, Karen Mistel, now, all three great actors. Well, this is safe for, stay for Karen Mistel because she really didn't do too much. She's really kind of pretty, you know, and she wears pink all the time, and her name is Bunny. <laughs> I love I love any kind of a movie that has a character named Bunny in it. Um, who does but this is a really silly movie, and, but it's cloaked inside a hot-button issue. It takes shots at feminism and equality between the sexes. So it's a very weird statement to make in the middle of this because this looks like something that, that our pal Fred Olin Ray would make. But he would make yes. it with, with much larger cup sizes and lots more nudity and lots more kind of sex. I mean, like, it's kind of like, I don't know, Dinosaur Island is, is the nearest I can come up with as far as, like, a comparison. So you were going to say Fred Olin Ray. I would have said Andy Sedaris. Oh, it could have been Andy Sedaris. Uh, Andy Sedaris is more about guns. He likes to watch. He likes to photograph big-breasted big women firing machine guns. 
Uh, but also Jim Wynarski. I would put Jim Wynarski in that group, too. Yeah, any of those three could have made this movie, but I don't think they could have made it as good as J.F. Lawton did it. Well, yeah, I really his, don't think he, they could have. Yeah, his script, his script is very good because, I mean, it's obviously a tribute. And you get past the message of it. It's a tribute to movies. There's a lot of stuff in there that, that people get from, like, there's a, you know, an obvious parody of, of um, Apocalypse Now. Because yes. we're, we're uh, Shannon Tweed plays this uh, tweed, uh, tweed. San, Shannon Tweed plays this college professor, middle of the road feminist. Let that one sink in. She is uh, asked by the military to go pursue Dr. Kurtz, who is played by Adrian Barbeau, who has just I mean like and all of this is taking place in um, in in Southern California in the avocado jungles of San Bernardino. She takes her assistant. She hires Bill Maher, who apparently she had a dalliance with. He's like this inept macho guide who is going to lead them down this river, which is really, I mean, like all of this is, there are actual, uh, from what I read of the notes of the movie, there were actual avocado jungles in that area as part of a university experiment for for uh, USC, I believe. So they were growing avocados down there. And hey, he was cheap. He did it for 50 bucks. Omar? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! Oh, the character. I mean, and the, and the, his character. He only took him down there for fifty bucks. <laughs> I was thinking you were talking about Mars pay for the movie. <laughs> he probably did me. He probably only made seventy five. Mm. I mean, you never know. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there in the dialogue that makes fun of the idea of feminism, as well as respect for cultural customs, no matter how violent or stupid they are. And sometimes somebody will get in a line that is absolutely brilliant. Uh, there was one line I forgot who says it. But she says, why do women argue over such petty differences? And I was thinking that this is what's happening right now. This is 2019, and right now we're having this battle between feminists and other women. And they are arguing over petty differences. And, and it seems like it's about control and domination more than equality. And I'm like, my God, this movie was made in, what, 1989? Yep. And, and they're, they're talking about these things that we're talking about now. That was 30 years ago. It seemed really ahead of its time. I was really kind of, I was very surprised by this. And also, I have to say, it's surprisingly well made and photographed. Unlike, you know, as far as, because I was looking at an, a high definition transfer of the film, it looked really good compared to Meridian, which we'll talk about later. I mean, I watched the, um, what is it? I have the laser disc of Cannibal Woman, but I did watch the uh, stream that's available on Tubi. Mm. And it was a very good quality, quality stream. It was taken from some good elements and they did a really good, they you know, high really, definition. Really good job. They cleaned it up. It doesn't look contrasting. The sound quality is very good. There's like a kind of Zucker Brothers sensibility to some of the humor I was thinking about. Especially, there's a scene before she goes off on the expedition, she grabs a bunch of supplies from this old lady who's apparently well-versed in guns and ammunition. And it reminded me very much of a scene that you would find in one of their movies. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there were a lot of good, there were a lot of good zingers, a lot of good one-liners, a couple of good sight gags. But at the same time, they knew what it was, but they wanted to take give it, some level of seriousness like it literally borderlined seriousness and parody uh there's even okay even speaking of being ahead of its time there's a whole tribe of beta males in this movie that kind of coexist peacefully i guess symbiotically with these uh with these piranha women in the movie they basically they become men overnight because bill maher gives them beer and there's a scene <laughs> that parodies 2001 where this guy throws the beer can up in the air and we hear yes. music that sounds a lot like uh, the music from 2001. Now, I think my only problem with the movie, um, and I know uh, Monsieur Gene Simmons will not, uh, will not, would not like this, is that I just don't think Shannon Tweed is realistic as a college she, professor. Oh, no, not, not in the very least. She's, I don't want to say this to sound like a total douchebag, but she's way too good looking. She's Well, yeah, she's, she's too pretty. Also, some of the dialogue just doesn't seem right coming out of her mouth. I feel like, you know, if she wants to seduce me in a hotel room with neon lights all around, I'm there. But when she's, like, pretending to be a college professor and talking to me about uh, feminism or something, I'm just like, what? It's like one of these things is not like the other. It doesn't seem to match up for me. It, it was a very entertaining movie. It was not boring. It was. It was It was very, it was just like you were about to say, it was entertaining. It wasn't boring for a single minute. It made me laugh. It did what it was supposed to do. And it came from Charlie Band, for God's sake. Uh -huh. I have a feeling, though, that uh, uh, Charles Band was not on the set all the time to ruin that movie. <laughs> no, this one, he I think he just financed it or something like that. He just that, said, go ahead, go make your movie, here's some money. <laughs> Now, which uh, which was funny because it didn't get like it did get a VHS release in 1989, 1990. Didn't get a laser disc release until like 94, 95. Yeah, it's kind of a hidden treasure. I remember my friend Andrew telling me about it a long time ago. He says you got to see this movie. It doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. Yeah, you know? right. It just it sounds crazier than what it is. Yeah, 
just give it a shot and you'll enjoy it. It's like, okay, cool. It is a good movie. But our next movie, oh, God. on the other hand, oh, boy. No. I'll let you, I'll let you kick this one no. off. No. Okay, this movie's called Meridian. Oh God, I spent <laughs> it, it, it. It makes your brain hurt just saying it. Doug. I'm pretty sure I spent maybe fifteen dollar, maybe twenty dollars, direct from Full Moon just to get the Blu-ray of this film. This is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life, and the, the Blu-ray makes it so much worse. the The Blu-ray really just the rendering is way too dark. This yeah, movie, it's... this movie is darker than Solo, and not in a good way because at least Solo looked pretty clean. There's too much um, grain in this. It looks like it came from, it looks like it, it came it from, from a, a print, a it very a print. heavily worn print where they tried to push up the brightness too much, and and the sound also is too jarring. There doesn't seem to be any noise reduction on either well, the, the dialogue on, or the music tracks. The sound on your Blu-ray, unfortunately, this is a this is a Charlie Band problem, which we have discussed. The man does not believe in putting lossless uh, audio on his Blu-rays. Because I understand that yours has a 5.1 mix, if I am correct. It has a 5.1 mix. Does it say that? It, yeah, yeah, I believe it does. But it just okay. you, you don't you, if, you can't you can't really disseminate uh, any right. 5.1 the, tracks going on in the thing. Right. The whole problem is you're taking a movie that was shot in two channel stereo. You're upresing it to 5.1. You're barely doing any separation to it, and on top of that, you're putting it on Blu-ray in a lossy audio format, which is terrible. Now. 88 films overseas did their version of it they used the same master but the transfer looked a lot better the black levels were better there was some crush but it wasn't as bad there was since there was no compression there wasn't a lot of macro blocking or there, was a, there was a lot of clipping too and not only in the dialogue yeah, oh, there was a ton of clipping but also in the in the score and it's so unfortunate because this is a it's a pretty good pino Dinaggio score that he's doing like a mix of you feel like like band had money and then ran out of it because he he has like some orchestral stuff in there and then they yeah, go strictly gonna, to synthesizers. Was, yeah, I was just gonna say that like when I was watching this, I'm like, okay, the opening orchestral score over the credits was actually really good, but then right when you get to the whole score of the movie, it's just like, okay, why am I listening to this '80s disco shit? <laughs> I, I'm like, seriously, like. Like what happened? Like this is not a Pino Donaggio score. It does not sound like anything Pino Donaggio would have done. But I, but I gotta tell you, it, uh, um, it played a lot, mu a lot better on cable when I saw it back, like in the early '90s. It looked so much better and sounded so much better when it was on cable TV. Before we did this episode, you asked me if I was gonna watch the laser disc, and I did. Uh, I watched a little bit of it. You know, did some of the scenes that I did like, and I will say the laser disc looked looked really good for a old analog, you know, format. The sound was really audible. You could hear everything. No dropouts. No nothing like that. I mean, and on top of that, the brightness levels where they should be. The br the black levels were good. You could actually see more in that old standard definition you know, realm, then you can this high definition one. Yeah. But then that's the problem with high definition these days is revisionism and people not paying attention to the type of prints or the type of, you know, film elements they're using. They're just doing a hackneyed job. Mm. But then at the same time, we're talking about Charles Band, who in and of himself is a fucking hack. He's, you know, he's he's very much a con artist. Definitely. He is. I that's, mean, we, I mean, we talked about we, uh, we have, a while back when we did our history of home video we talked a little bit about the wizard uh, boxes that uh, he swore up and down were real. And somebody, I forget who it was, it was uh, Paul from VHS Collector, put together some videos where he showed his original wizard boxes and he compared them to these new ones that Charles Band said he had. And they found that they were just kind of like cheap copies. They were, they were cheap prints, pr uh, printed up from a computer probably. I mean, yeah, we had that discussion too. I mean, I told you about the guy who gave Charlie Band a statue you know, for him personally, and then Charlie Band repurposed it and sold it in the Full Moon store. <laughs> you, know, you know, Charlie would do anything for a fucking dollar. Well, that, that's that I mean, man, like he, uh, he, I, I won't, I won't, I won't go all the way. And I do believe that Charles Band is a gifted filmmaker. He does have an eye, but uh, he's obviously much more of a businessman. He knows how to run a business. He knows how to stay in profit. <laughs> well. Sorry. Oh, while you're sneezing there, I can tell you some of the things why this movie was a disappointment to me. I will start from a production standpoint. Uh, first and foremost, we've already talked about the Pino Dinaggio score, how it is does not rank amongst any of his best work. So that's strike one. Strike two is the screenwriter. Now, when I watched it, I saw the name Dennis Paoli. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a second. This is from the guy who made fucking Reanimator mm. and From Beyond? Yeah. Okay, this movie should be really good. 
nope. <laughs> like not 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 in the least. That's my theory. I told you. I, I felt like this movie was shot in a weekend. I felt that they had access to a castle. He he grabbed the, the first good screenwriter he could find. He said, Try to write me something around this castle. And they did it. They and he wrote it very quickly. That's why they, I have no idea what's going on in this movie. We're talking okay, this, 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 we're talking about the story here, right? Right. I'm assuming we're in Italy. Charlotte and Fennon are cute friend are artists. They believe in truth. I wrote that in parentheses. There's a weird sideshow carnival thing rolling in a town. She has the players over for dinner. She gets raped or something, and there's a werewolf beast thing running around. I, I felt like there were good ideas in there, but the execution of support made me oh, angry. Yeah, the ex- this movie the ex- made me angry. It, I don't. It didn't make me angry because I had to look at. Okay, you had told me that it was bad. Excuse me for that. Uh, you had told me it was bad, so I'm like, okay, let me check it out. And to borrow a line from Amazon Women on the Moon, I don't think I hated it as much as you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, the things I didn't like, where I said was, I did not like the screenplay. I did not like the music. Um, we both agreed that the two female leads were miscast. Yeah. That, but at the same time, this was the 80s. It was a cheap movie, so you take what you can get. Luckily, they both went on to bigger and better things. But what I did like, I did like the production values. I thought it was a very well shot movie, courtesy of Mac Allberg, who yeah, is well, yeah, Mac- one of the ki- he's one of the king of the bees here. The man did a Nightmare on Elm Street for Christ's sake. Well, he also shot John Landis's Innocent Blood. He did House. I mean, I mean, Mac Allberg's been there from the B-movie front since day one, and as far as I can tell by watching this, this was just like anything that he had shot back in the 80s, so that was one I, good You thing know, the thing about it, it's all lost on me because of this Blu-ray. I could not see the photography, let alone enjoy it in any way. The, bla- the Black Crush was the only thing that really... The Black Crush and the macro blocking of the transfer, yeah, they did get in the way, but at least I got past that. The editing was actually pretty good. Well, I don't you know. I found it repetitive. E- I mean, it's just basically... It's shots of Sherilyn Fenn wandering around her castle while her cute friend cleans up a painting. I think know? we can both agree, though, that seeing Sherilyn Fenn and Charlie Spradling naked was actually a plus. I sub- well, you know, I mean, that's... I, she is... Uh, Sherilyn Fenn is amazingly beautiful. She was one of these amazingly beautiful women. She still looks good these days. But her voice is flat. She has no weight, and she she's not as good. I mean, like, the the, the whole thing, I mean, it's just like, and, and that Euro trash dude who's playing the twins, I mean, it's just very, there's no chemistry. There's no, it's not sex. It really wasn't sexy, and it should have been sexy. I mean, this, this kind of it movie should have, should have been a lot sexier. Um, he should have been. A, he, he should have been played by a younger guy. This is like I was watching this and I was thinking: there's the Howling, there's American Werewolf in London, there's plenty of sexy werewolves out there, sexy werewolf movies, and you even have Pino Donaggio doing the music for this. It's just missing. It's missing um, a, an indefinable quality that I think Charles Band just doesn't know how to accomplish. Charles, you know what Charles Band is good at? He's good at like I don't know, kind of like a schlocky story. This wasn't even schlocky. It was just. It was just sort of like it was all style and no substance. There was nothing. Exactly, yeah, it was that was that that was my thing. It was literally all style, no substance. And that was. That, <laughs> well, I'll give him credit for this. I'll give him credit for this. This this whole visual style that he comes up with and the and and the mise en scène, if you will. I'm going to get pretentious. It predates Bram Stoker's Dracula for t- by two years, so it is technically ahead of its time. But Bram Stoker's Dracula is such a beautiful movie to look at. So beautifully shot. So beautifully put together. Uh, and and he did this. He did this movie two years before that movie came out. So you got to give him a little credit for that. I'll give him a little credit. I mean, I honestly, we were talking about this. I honestly think that movie had to have been in production at Empire, and I think they picked it up at Full Moon because, like, it doesn't feel like a Full Moon movie. Well, I don't think, you know, I mean, okay, now, Fenn was also on Twin Peaks at the same time this movie came out. This movie came out in 1990, and right. Twin Peaks was uh, premiered that year as well. So I'm wondering if he got her before Twin Peaks or got her during it. No, he got her. That was a definite got her before. He definitely got her before that. Because, because she was, then because, she would okay, do um, Two Moon Junction there, or something. Was that the name of the movie? There was a, a video just came up on um, this is I know we're going to be filming this later or this is going to come up later, but a video just came up today on YouTube from Good Bad Flicks. I know I assume you know that guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen this. Um, Out of Control from 1985. She was in that. That's right. I mean, this and Puppet Master, I honestly think they were done. I mean, they, 
Puppet Master has been said that it was meant to be released by Empire Pictures, but then they folded. But then when Full Moon came about, well, she was in a okay. Wow, I just looked at her, a little bit of her uh, her her filmography here. She was in The Wildlife. You remember that movie? With Chris yep, Penn. great movie. She was in great a movie, movie called Thrashing with Josh Brolin. Another great movie. She was in The Wraith uh, with Charlie Sheen. Uh, she was in Zombie High, which with uh, 1987 with Virginia Madsen. So she and she was also in Just One of the Guys. So now you at least know that. This movie was had to have been done, you know, before she got really big. So yeah. I'm honestly saying this movie probably was filming in 1988, 1989. Yeah. And then they had they had to stop it or it just got picked up and done by Full Moon because you and I both know no Full Moon like the back of our hands. We know what a Full Moon movie looks like when we see one. Yeah. This movie does not in any way, shape, or form feel like a full moon flick. It feels like an Empire Pictures flick. I guess, it, yeah. It, it really, I mean, to me, it's Especially does. they shot a lot of their stuff in Italy, didn't they? Yeah, oh, dude, they shot everything in Italy. They, they um, was it Reanimator was shot in Rome? Mm, yeah. Uh, from from Beyond, I believe, was shot. I mean, he, oh, speaking Charlie, of which, Reanimator is on Showtime. I'm going to tape it because I've never seen it in high def before. Dude, I bought the Blu-ray from uh, Arrow, that, that limited edition that came out that got the 4K scan, man. It's a thing of beauty. Well, if you've never you seen know, it, I mean, Stuart Gordon. Stuart Gordon is an actual filmmaker. He's like a real filmmaker. He actually cares. He does. <laughs> I and feel that's like why okay. Can I can I ask so you this? Good. As short as this movie was, I was wishing that it would end. But doesn't it feel like it's missing it a real? On, does it, it feel like it's missing like about twenty minutes more of? Like, I feel like it. It was kind of rushed. It feels rushed, kind of like in the story in a way. If there is a story in this whole thing. It feels like it's. I feel. I feel like I'm missing a reel out of this movie. Like like somebody forgot to, to to lock off another reel and throw it in there. I'd say there's probably about a good ten minutes that went on the cutting room floor. I would, maybe fifteen. I, I don't know. Maybe try, I'll go. I'll go even higher. Maybe twenty minutes. I think twenty minutes are missing from this movie in some way. I mean, it wasn't the one of the worst movies I've ever seen, but it was probably I'm gonna say one of the worst Full Moon or Empire Pictures I've ever seen because. Like you said, all style, no substance whatsoever. Yeah, I felt like uh, there, there were a couple of, uh, oh, God. There was a series of movies that Full Moon did. Subspecies? Is that what it's called? No, the subspecies movies, well, the first three they are They were kind of done with the... that style and that kind of photography, too. Yeah, but those were actually done by a good filmmaker, though. Charlie <laughs> didn't do those, I don't think. <laughs> Charlie just produced those, yeah. but he didn't make them. You got to remember, so many Full Moon movies came out, like, we're talking Paramount Full Moon before it became Charlie Full Moon. Yeah. Um, so many Full Moon flicks came out that Charlie actually did, but they were like, I'd say he directed about 25%, and then 75% were directed by other people. Like, okay, best example, Arcade and Dollman mm -hmm. were done by Albert Pune. Yeah. What is it? David S. Goyer, who later went on to do, you know, the Batman reboot, you know, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark yeah. Knight Rises. Uh, he had his hand in arcade. He wrote that screenplay. You know, he, he got his foot in the door writing Full Moon stuff. You know, so that's why some of those movies came out really, really good back in those days, because there were actually some good, talented filmmakers behind the camera. Yeah. But then after he lost his Paramount deal, then it just it just went out the damn door. Okay. I mean, it really did. I did see. I did see a couple of movies. I believe Charles Band directed Metal Storm, right? He did. That was. I uh, saw his, that his, in the his... movie theater when it came out. But that was like a last desperate thing because everything else was sold out. That was the only movie that wasn't sold out, so we just went to the to see it. Did you see it in three D? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, we had the three D glasses too. That was. A, I I like that movie. I don't love it, but I like it. What I really yeah. did enjoy, I think, mainly from from. Band was the Trancers movies. Oh yes, the 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 first one, the first three, are all awesome. After the fourth one, it starts starts taking a steady decline. Yeah, and the less we talk about uh, six and seven, the better. Yeah. Oh, but, I mean, like it had Tim Thomerson in it, and I knew Tim Thomerson from stand up comedy. He was in he was a uh, he was on HBO a lot doing the stand up comedy. But uh, that's. Uh... This is a different kind of movie. This Meridian movie. It's, I really, I can't, I can't really recommend it. I think the only way to watch that movie is if you have a tube television and a video cassette. Don't watch the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. It has a couple of special features on there too, including a behind-the-scenes, which I might actually look at just because I'm curious. But, but uh, d d don't buy the movie. Yeah, it's not worth your time. I mean, I only own it because I have all the full moon movies on Laserdisc, so it's kind of like. I had to own it to own it. I didn't even hear this movie until I was until I bought it. I'm like, 
why is this the only full moon movie I've never heard of? <laughs> now I now and now I know why. Now you know why. Now I know why. <laughs> well, I I'd say the uh, Sherilyn Fenn is a is a fine actress with good directors. She was fine on Twin Peaks. Uh, even recently, we've been watching Gilmore Girls, and she has a recurring part uh, toward the end of that show, uh, and she's not terrible. She's 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 a fine actress. I think I just think some actors need good directors. They need good directors to be able to. Uh, I mean, to pull it off. Yeah. Welcome back to this segment. This is not a Warner Brothers clamshell. I just wanted to dig this one out because I have a couple of memories attached to it. It's Radioactive Dreams starring John Stockwell and Michael Dudikoff. And it's kind of funny, a couple of weeks ago I was looking at some YouTube video of failed sitcoms of the 80s and Michael Dudikoff was in one of those uh, failed sitcoms. This is before this movie, probably 83, 84, something like that. This is Vestron Video. As you can see here, Radioactive Dreams, interesting cover design. Uh, this is like a typical kind of Albert Pune uh, fantasy. He, he enjoys doing fantasies about apocalyptic wastelands and worlds and kind of like young people in, uh, in over their head. Uh, who else is in this? George Kennedy, Don Murray, Michelle Little, uh, Norbert Weiser, who I know, he was uh, in a few movies of that time, and Lisa Blount. And the movie was written and directed by Albert Pune. Albert Pune is a Facebook friend. Nice guy. Um, he made a movie recently. He's been getting it seen. Here we have Raymond Chandler, Meet Mad Max. And it's, it's, it's a strange, this is a strange movie. Like I said, about an apocalyptic wasteland, but it has musical sequences in it. it you know what it is? It's kind of like Hope and Crosby uh, meets The Day After. Uh, and here we have... Well, the sticker doesn't look too good here. But, again, Vestrum Video. I don't know what those stains are. It's very weird. And I, but, again, I don't see any mold. It's very interesting. Okay, now the story, I guess, is that uh, my friend Andrew really wanted me to see the movie. He had it. He happened to have it on video. I don't know how the hell he got it. He, he lent it to me. Um, he just said it's just like a weird, wacky, off-the-wall thing. you got to watch it. Get, you know, get it on the record that you saw the movie. So I did. Very strange. Very strange movie. Uh, do not be confused with Electric Dreams starring Virginia Madsen. But, uh, again, entertaining, you go out there, you have very little money, and you, you manage to do something that might even be the slightest bit entertaining is still better than anything that's being produced today. Thanks for watching. <laughs>